Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, you indeed are mighty to save. You brought us life out of death, hope out of hopelessness. And Lord, you've given us tremendous opportunities to share that love as we freely serve the people that you put into our lives. At times, Lord, we can be really reluctant, like Jonah, not really wanting to go the direction you call us to go. But Lord, you can work amazing things as you work through us and impact the lives of those around us. Lord, help us to be people who are willing to serve. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, a rather lonely fellow stands at a bar looking at his drink. For almost a half hour, he just stares blankly at it. Then all of a sudden, a big, burly, troublemaking truck driver comes up, snatches the drink, and just chugs it all down. Instantly, the lonely man breaks down and starts crying. Oh, come on, says the truck driver. I was just messing with you. Look, I'll buy you another drink. I can't stand to see a grown man cry. But you don't understand, the man replies. This has been the worst day of my life. I overslept this morning. When I got into work, the boss fired me. When I left the building to go and get my car, it was gone. The police were of no help to me at all today. Well, eventually I took a taxi home. <laughs> you can guess what happened. I left my wallet and credit cards on the back seat. Before I could get the driver's attention, he was gone. And then I go home and I get in. My wife has left me a note on the kitchen counter saying she was dumping me for the mailman. So I came here to this bar. I have been standing here for the longest time just thinking of ending it all, but just as I was about to do it, you came over and drank my poison. <laughs> now, uh, is that the definition of a loser or what? <laughs> now, look, I realize this story is extreme, but I think it's something we can all relate to. Have you ever felt like Capital L, loser. I know I have. You just can't get something right after repeated attempts. The final exam you had studied for and thought you should have aced comes back with a B minus. Well, hey, at least you passed. In a moment of anger, you scream at your girlfriend. She responds by slapping you in the face and running off in tears. Some blunders in life are next to impossible to undo. Feelings of failure, and there's no way I can help anybody, are all too common. And history tells us the same thing. I think I've shared this story before, but it bears repeating. How many of you have heard of Roy Riggles? Just out of curiosity. Oh, okay, maybe I haven't. Back in the 1929 Rose Bowl, he snapped up a fumble off the ground and quickly ran 65 yards in the wrong direction. Now fortunately, one of Roy's teammates chased him down and tackled him before he scored a safety. Well, unfortunately, after three plays, a three and out, his team had to punt. That kick was blocked out of the back of the end zone. Safety, two points. Would you like to guess how many points Roy's team lost by that Rose Bowl that day? Two. After this event, this gentleman was forever known as Wrong Way Riggles. Now, just like Roy Riggles, there are times we can find ourselves going the wrong direction. We make poor choices. We let God, we let the people we care about down. But the next time you feel yourself struggling with, well, shame, remorse, or guilt, like you're a wrong way wriggles, remember the words of today's text from Jonah chapter 3. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Here's what led to this pretty familiar story. 
God told Jonah to go to Nineveh, the capital of ancient of Assyria and the sworn enemy of God's people. But Jonah said, uh-uh, he went the other direction. He went west to Tarshish instead of east to Nineveh. He didn't think the Ninevites deserved God's love one bit. And I guess his fears were understandable. I mean, after all, Nineveh was not exactly the Bible Belt. I would think that if they had a high school, the scoreboard out on the Nineveh High School football field might well have read, Home of the Barbarians. They terrorized the world in their day. So Jonah decided to split rather than to serve. I think you remember what happened next. There was the storm at sea, Jonah overboard, the giant fish, and then God causing that fish to set Jonah not too pleasantly out on a beach. How do you think Jonah felt at that big point? Probably like a bit of a loser who couldn't help anybody. But the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. I firmly believe the book of Jonah is not so much about a great fish as it is about a good and gracious God who speaks to us, who confronts our rebellion when we refuse to listen and follow, and who restores us to be able to serve others by second chances through his love. I hear a lot of gospel in that. There's a lot of grace that's there. Good news for people just like you and me who desperately need to be restored. People who could use a second, third, or a hundredth chance. You see, our God is a God of restoration. Though we fail, God absolutely refuses to quit on us. He searches for us just as he searched for Jonah. He even decided to go so far as to send his son from heaven to earth for us, to find you and me in the midst of our own rebellion. Jesus' quest, and he knew this from day one, took him straight to a cross. And it was his death for you and me that took away our rebellion, that took away our sin, and restored a broken relationship with our Heavenly Father. So God restores us, not just to forgive us, but to love and to speak of his word and hope to others as we serve him. Isn't that what happened with Jonah? Because the Lord commanded Jonah to go ahead and do, well, what he commanded him to do the first time around. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message that I give to you. So this time, instead of running away, Jonah ran the right way. He now knew, hey, God is with me, that he has a plan. So the prophet began the 500-mile journey across the high mountains and the high desert plains to the ancient city of Nineveh. Now when Jonah arrived there, this is actually what archaeologists believe Nineveh looked like in ancient times, he must have been staggered by the size of this city. Archaeologists today believe that Nineveh was about 350 square miles in size. Remember, this is the ancient world. It had a population, the Bible tells us, of 120,000 people. That is massive by ancient standards. The city walls in spots were 100 foot high, and they were so wide it was said you could drive three chariots across in length across it. And if that wasn't amazing enough, can you imagine this reluctant prophet looking at the shrines and temples on just about every corner that the Ninevites had built to their gods of land and earth, sea and wind, but undaunted in the midst of that idolatry and that luxury, Jonah proclaimed a God-given, simple and powerful message. He cried out, repent, 40 days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. Talk about a short-to-the-point message. If I were to ask most followers of Jesus this question, what's the greatest miracle in the book of Jonah? My guess is that a large number would say, well, Jonah's surviving in the belly of a fish for three days. Yeah, that is a huge miracle. 
But I believe that miracle takes a very distant second to what God worked through Jonah in that ancient city of Nineveh. The greatest miracle in the book of Jonah is that even though a very reluctant prophet preached one sentence to a pagan, violent city, everyone in the city repented and believed in the Lord. The Bible tells us very clearly that every Ninevite, from the littlest to the largest, all 120,000 of them, including the king, took Jonah seriously, and they responded immediately. They literally humbled themselves before the Lord, and they turned back to him. They turned from their evil ways. And this was more than an outward show or mere lip service to God, because it says that they fasted, they prayed, they changed their lives from the bottom of their hearts. Listen to these words from the king. Who knows, said the king of Nineveh, Perhaps the Lord will change his mind and not destroy us. This is from a pagan king. That's exactly what happened. When God saw their turning of heart, repentance, which literally means to turn from or turn to, God had compassion on them. He didn't destroy them. Talk about a miracle. Now, do you see the irony in all of this? The great city, city of Nineveh was restored through the preaching of a very reluctant prophet who was himself given a second chance to serve. And even though Jonah did not want to share God's word at first, look what happened when he did. The results were astounding. When you share Jesus with others, you may never know what the results are going to be. God may not convert an entire city through your words, but he may transform a family, a circle of friends, co-workers, maybe someone from the next generation who will be the link that God uses in his chain of grace to keep sharing the good news. And if Nineveh can repent, anybody can repent. And remember, it's not you or I that bring about repentance. It comes through the Word of God, which is more powerful than anything we could say of ourselves. Now, we may think, okay, I know that I should share the love of Jesus with, or my faith with this other person, but what good is it going to do? Who am I to be able to persuade him? Well, he would never become a follower of Jesus anyway. Perhaps we think that they're too far gone. They're too out of control, angry, or self-absorbed, or damaged to ever follow Jesus. Who are we to make that judgment? And that, well, I'm too weak. I'm powerless. I'm incompetent. I'm so clumsy in my speech. Why would God work through me? Sometimes it seems a lot easier, especially today, to label people or disregard them than it is to reach out with the love of Jesus. We see them, or ourselves, as being helpless or hopeless. But to God, these are possibilities. He loves all people. In the book of Mark, we hear that when Jesus landed and saw the large crowd, he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus' death on the cross paid for the sin of the world, the whole world. And in his great mercy, God wants to save all that run away from him. Not just the Jonas in our world, but the Ninevites. Don't worry about what you're going to actually say to people. Those 120,000 Ninevites did not become followers of the Lord because of uh, Jonah's expertise or because his message was one sentence. The miracle was due to one thing. Jonah's message was charged with the power of God. And that's still true today. Even though God uh, doesn't command us to go out, and I hope you don't do this, in 40 days all of Sandpoint will be destroyed. Don't do that. 
The message we share, in fact, is the greatest message of all. The one true God loves you dearly, and He desires more than anything else a personal, ongoing relationship with you. You see, eternal life and salvation are yours because of the life, the love, the serving of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you thought, man, it's hopeless, God came in and Jesus drank your poison, your sin. When you share your faith, just like Jonah did, your message is God's message. As the Holy Spirit works powerfully in and through you, Paul put it this way, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people. We are one in Christ. Remember Wrong Way Riggles? There's actually a little bit more to the story. They don't wear helmets like that anymore, do they? His goof happened in the first half. At halftime, he sat in the locker room with a blanket over his shoulders, face buried in his hands, and crying like a baby. The coach said, okay, first half starters, you're going to start the second half. All the guys then got up, except for Roy. The coach looked back at him and said, Roy, did you hear me? Get up, let's go. Roy looked up and said, Coach, I can't do it. I've ruined you, I've ruined myself. I just can't face the crowd. The coach answered, Roy, get up. The game is only half over. Rather reluctantly, Roy put on his helmet and got going. Sports writers who covered that 1929 Rose Bowl later wrote that Roy probably played one of the best halves of his life. So this next time that you hear or read about Jonah, say to yourself, how great is our God? When we take the ball and run in the wrong direction, when we stumble and fall headfirst into our sin, and are so ashamed of it, we never want to try again, God comes to you. He bends over you and says, get up, go back. The game is only half over. Strengthened by his presence, we forgive others as we have been forgiven, we love as we have been loved, and we speak of his wonderful life and hope to others. Thanks be to the God who restores us through the cross of Jesus and leads us to go from there to serve others. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all of our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the true faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.